My name is Shannon Morgan, and welcome to Bigfoot Case Files. Don't forget to enter the Bigfoot Case Files and Bigfoot Encounters narrated giveaway that was posted on December 1st. The link to the three-hour marathon is in the description of this video. Please see the Bigfoot Case Files community page for an itemized list of all the prizes you could win, as well as the official rules. Thank you for participating. I wish you all the best of luck. It was 2018. I can't remember if it was January or February. The weather in Michigan was foggy, with light, freezing drizzle, which is common for that time of year. I was driving from Twin Lake to White Cloud to investigate some real estate that my husband and I were interested in buying. The area I was in consisted of a lot of wooded areas with extremely thick patches of trees, open grasslands, and pastures. There was light agriculture in the area still, but the land was being snapped up by real estate developers. To the east, there were more rolling hills and forests. Very few people lived in that area. I was about nine miles south of the toll complex, and as I approached a bridge, I saw a reddish-brown patch of color up ahead on the right side of the road. Normally, I often saw deer along this stretch of road, so I initially thought that this must be a deer too. But when I got closer, I could see through the windshield wipers, and I realized this thing was too tall to be a deer. Since the roads were slick and had patches of ice on them, I was driving slowly, about 35 miles per hour. I saw that this thing was a dark figure, standing upright, and it was on the outside of the guardrail. I couldn't imagine why someone would be standing on the outside of the guardrail before the bridge. I knew there was a steep embankment leading down to the river level from the roadway, and I was afraid I was witnessing someone who was going to take their life. As I got closer, I was afraid to honk or flash my lights, fearing that they might jump if I startled them. I slowed down, and as I got closer, that was when I noticed that this wasn't human. It was tall, thin, and had a skinny figure. It appeared to be as tall as a basketball player, around seven feet in height. This thing wasn't wearing any clothing, which I found extremely disturbing, especially considering the weather. That's when I noticed that its arms were extremely long, longer than what I was accustomed to seeing in humans, and it had shaggy rolls of hair hanging from its arms and body. I was certain that it looked like hair and not fur. The hair almost resembled dreadlocks, but much shorter, like clumps of matted hair on a dog. The skin on its chest area had a flesh-toned appearance, and there wasn't any hair across the upper chest. I noticed that this thing had both ape-like and human characteristics, leaving no doubt in my mind that it was really an animal. Growing up in southwestern Georgia, I had heard stories all of my life about Bigfoot and Sasquatch, but I always assumed that they were just stories and had been made up. I had seen several Bigfoot shows in passing, and I compared what I saw to the stereotypical description. It was pretty similar, but it did not match completely, mainly due to its thin build. All the stories that I had ever heard said that Bigfoot was quite muscular. As I began to pull closer to it, I turned on my bright lights. This creature began to raise its arm to shield its face from the high beams. It stood, motionless and stationary, as if waiting for me to pass. When I passed within 20 feet or so, I slowed down even further, to 20 miles per hour or less, and I looked over my right shoulder but it was out of the view of my headlights. I did not see it again from that point. As I drove forward, I felt my neck hair stand up, and within a few minutes, I felt extremely nauseous. I tried to convince myself that I didn't see what I saw. As I personally didn't really believe in such things, I kept the incident to myself until I returned home late that evening, and I shared it with my husband and son. While my husband laughed and made fun of me, my young son thought it was cool. Over the few weeks and months following the sighting, it continued to bother me. I decided to run a Google search to find out if other sightings had taken place in the area. To my surprise, I learned that there were several accounts of seeing Bigfoot in that area. I imagined that with the deforestation and development, it was being forced out of its natural habitat. I was excited, and I told my husband what I had found out. But my husband was quick to discourage me from submitting a report to the local sheriff or anyone else. In 2008, I had a co-worker who arrived at work one day looking pretty upset. 
she shared with me that she had a terrifying encounter while driving, claiming to have seen a large creature crossing the road right in front of her car. Being curious about such things, I asked her for specific details. At that time, I didn't know much about cryptids or Bigfoot, but I was pretty intrigued, and I wanted to see if there was anything to discover. That weekend, I decided to venture out to the spot where my coworker had had her encounter. It was a pretty remote area, approximately two miles out of town, surrounded by farmland, mainly consisting of cornfields. I gathered my gear, which was simply a backpack with water and snacks, and embarked on my search by venturing into the cornfields. It didn't take long before I stumbled upon a game trail. Intrigued, I followed the trail, and it led me to a clearing. At first, I couldn't quite make out what I was seeing, but as I looked closer, I realized that I was walking on what appeared to be a bone bed. There were numerous small animal bones scattered throughout the area, along with larger remains of a deer. These deer remains seemed to be a mix of roadkill, partial hunting kills, or taxidermy remnants. The deer skeletons had no heads that had been discarded over the bluff's edge. With all of these remains strewn about and a clear path leading to a lakefront, it became evident to me why an animal might be drawn to this place, possibly making regular visits to scavenge easy meals before crossing the road. With this newfound understanding, I decided to leave the area and returned the following month. That's when things took a turn for the creepy. I arrived back at the site around 7.30 a.m. the next day. It was an incredibly foggy morning, perhaps the foggiest in the history of this county. The lake was enveloped in a thick fog, and there was condensation all around the area, especially along the bluff and trail. My intention was simply to retrieve the camera that I had set up on a tree and quickly make my way back to the car. I left the car unlocked and ready to go, grabbed the camera, and noticed that it had been tripped three or four times. Curiosity got the better of me, and I was eager to see if I had captured any pictures, so I promptly headed back towards the bluff. As I walked, I heard something pacing me in a large gully, about 40 feet to the left. It didn't concern me initially, as I had never encountered anything there during my previous visits. Additionally, I faintly heard a conversation nearby, presumably between two men on a boat in the lake, making their way under the bridge. About halfway up the trail, the sounds of movement briefly stopped. They seemed to shift further to the left, in the direction of the voices that I had heard. Taking note of this, I continued my ascent. But as I approached the turnaround point, I no longer heard any movement. So I began putting the camera away in the back of my car, a Honda Element with a rear hatch. As I stepped back to shut the hatch, I caught a strong smell, reminiscent of a wet dog. Surprisingly, when I stepped back towards the car, the smell was hardly detectable. A breeze was blowing from my right side. And when I shut the rear gate and turned to the right, I caught sight of a figure suddenly standing up about 80 feet away in the tree line near the bridge. It appeared to be a broad-shouldered, hulking figure without a head, but as I focused my gaze, I noticed a darker area between its shoulders, and it dawned on me that it was a face held low in either a peering or aggressive stance. In retrospect, I believe it may have heard the rear hatch slam and mistakenly thought it was a car door, possibly anticipating my departure. For a few seconds, it stood still, but then it began swaying from side to side, lowering and raising itself while intently peering at me. The impression that I got was that this creature was elderly, judging by its behavior, peculiar posture, and coloration. I began to make out its features, gray chest hair running wider at the center line of the neck, and honey brown reddish hair along its arms and body. It had remarkably wide shoulders and massive low-hanging arms. In the midst of observing this creature, I heard another snippet of conversation drifting up from the lake, followed by laughter. And then the creature emitted a loud bellow that could only be compared to an angry bull. It started moving in my direction, and at that moment, a much stronger odor, reminiscent of rotting meat, engulfed the air. Feeling the urgency to leave, I decided to get into the car. But as I turned to walk around to the driver's side, the creature scolded me in a deep, low, bassy language which only increased my sense of trespassing and trouble. The combination of its yelling, the odor, and the surge of adrenaline left me disoriented for a few seconds. I felt an unexplainable, instinctual urge to sit or lie down on the ground, much like a prey animal might react. But I resisted that impulse, and I quickly climbed into the car, glancing back at the creature. 
It hadn't changed its position since I had gone out of its field of view behind the car. It continued to peer intently at me. In that moment, I did the only sensible thing that I could think of. I fixed my gaze upon the creature, noting its position in relation to the guardrail and the top of my side window. Unfortunately, in my panicked state, it didn't even register to me that I was still clutching the pistol that I usually carried in the field for protection against coyotes and now black bears. The pistol was lying on the passenger car seat, so I unholstered it and watched through the half-open passenger window. The creature let out another loud grunt, and it began moving towards the car, staying close to the guardrail that ran across the bridge. I admit, I was in a sheer state of panic, so I pointed the gun out the window, aiming it towards the ground, and I fired two shots. The irrational part of me hoped that the creature, now clearly visible as a large bipedal hairy being, would seize its approach. Meanwhile, the rational part of me believed that if it behaved like an animal, it would bolt upon hearing the shots. On the other hand, if it was somehow a human being, it would either yell something like don't shoot or make a swift escape. But the creature's reaction was neither. It simply stopped in its tracks, now standing just 30 feet away, and it stared. Unfortunately, I forgot that the gun was still in my hand. As I went to shift the car into drive, I accidentally fired another round directly into the center console. The sound vibrated against the confines of my Honda Element, which was essentially a big metal box. And then, I sped away from the scene, my ears ringing from the gunshot. When I arrived back at the farm, it became apparent to me that my car had sustained damage. The windows were unresponsive, and upon inspecting the console, I discovered that the wiring harness had completely fallen apart. I spent the rest of that morning arranging for a car hauler to come pick up the vehicle and tried to tell my family what had happened, who were attending the reunions. Eventually, I left Louisville with the damaged car. Since then, there have been additional events at the location. The area has since been cleaned up, fenced off, and heavily posted with no dumping signs. But direct sightings of the creature have not been reported, and the investigation is ongoing. To provide a detailed description of the creature, It stood at approximately seven and a half feet in height, with massive shoulders spanning around three and a half feet across. Its arms hung low, while its abdomen appeared thin. I determined its size by returning to the location a couple of weeks later with others, and using an extending paint pole to measure the distance from where I had parked to the spot where I had fixed its position. The creature's chest was covered in gray hair, which transitioned to an almost white coloration at the center line and neck. Its face, resembling that of a black gorilla, lacked distinct features, but I noticed a larger, flattened, almost human-like nose with a crease running down the center. Although I couldn't see its teeth, there was a darker area where the mouth was located, which occasionally moved and formed shapes when it vocalized. Its eyes were dark and devoid of color. The head was rounded, not conical, and it appeared as though the hair on top was slightly thinning, revealing a glimpse of a dark scalp. I didn't notice any visible tears on its face, as far as I could tell. The encounter left me shaken, and forever changed. To this day, I continue to reflect on that spine-chilling experience, pondering the true nature of the creature that I encountered that foggy morning. It was the summer of 1996, and my family and I had decided to escape the chaos of the city for a peaceful weekend getaway in Illinois. We rented a cozy cabin nestled in the woods, just a stone's throw away from the beautiful beach. It seemed like the perfect place to unwind and reconnect with nature. As we settled into our new temporary home, I couldn't help but feel a sense of relief wash over me. The air was crisp, the surroundings were serene. This is exactly what we needed, a break from the hustle and bustle of everyday life. The first day went by without a hitch. We spent hours frolicking on the sandy beach, building sandcastles, and splashing in the cool waters. Laughter filled the air as my children chased each other. Their joy was infectious. But as the sun began to set, I noticed faint sounds echoing through the woods. It was like a distant wood knocking. I brushed it off as nothing more than wildlife, or perhaps even my imagination playing tricks on me. But the next day, the wood knocking grew louder and more persistent. It seemed to follow us wherever we went, on our hikes through the forest, during our picnics by the lake, even as we sat around the campfire at night. 
The sounds grated on my nerves, disrupting what was supposed to be a peaceful retreat. I tried my best to ignore it, focusing instead on making memories with my family. One afternoon, as my children begged me to join them in a game of catch on the beach, I couldn't help but feel torn. Part of me wanted to indulge in their innocent joy, to forget about the unsettling sounds, but another part of me yearned for peace and quiet. Reluctantly, I put on a smile and I joined my children on the beach. I threw the ball with all of my might, trying to push away the frustration and immerse myself into their world. But deep down, I knew something was wrong. The wood knocking persisted, as if it was taunting me. And as the sun began to set again, casting long shadows across the beach, a chilling thought crept into my mind. What if the source of these sounds was something more sinister than just wildlife? That night, as we gathered around the campfire to roast marshmallows, a hooting sound echoed through the woods. It was unlike anything I had heard before. It was a haunting, otherworldly cry. The atmosphere felt tense, and my whole family had unease in their eyes. Trying to maintain a sense of normalcy, I mustered a smile, and I handed out the marshmallows. But deep down, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was terribly wrong. As we sat there, the hooting continued, growing louder and more persistent. And it also seemed to be getting closer, as if whatever was responsible for the sound was drawing nearer to the cabin. I had to make a split-second decision. I told everyone I thought it was time we head inside and to call it a night. Everyone was confused and disappointed, but they trusted my judgment and began to gather their belongings. As we hurriedly made our way back to the safety of the cabin, I couldn't help but feel a sense of relief wash over me. That night, as I laid in bed, exhaustion finally overtook me. But just as I was about to drift off into sleep, I heard a tapping sound on my window. My heart raced, and I carefully approached the window to investigate. Peering through the glass, my eyes widened in disbelief. There, standing just beyond the tree line, was a creature that looked like Bigfoot, towering and covered in shaggy hair. Its eyes seemed to glow, and it stared directly at me. I got the sudden feeling that maybe we were not welcome here. I couldn't believe my eyes. Was this some sort of hallucination brought on by exhaustion? I rubbed my eyes, hoping that the creature would disappear, but it stayed there. It gave three loud hoots and then disappeared into the forest. I was panicked, and I stumbled back from the window. Just as I was about to wake my wife and children, I looked out the window again but the Bigfoot was no longer there. The tapping on the window stopped, and there was an eerie silence. The events of the past few days had shattered my sense of security and left me questioning almost everything. The next day, I had decided, much to my family's disappointment, to end our vacation early. Sadly, I decided to make up a lie and say how for the last days of our family vacation, we would go to a water park and make it a tradition. My wife eyed me suspiciously, but didn't push me any further because she did love water parks. To this day, I have never told her what I saw, and I hope to never return to that cabin. I used to do crazy things when I was younger. At least they seem crazy now. Though at the time, they seemed normal, just something to do. One of these activities was climbing alone which of course entailed hiking and camping alone to get to the climb. I thought nothing of loading up my backpack and heading out into some of the most rugged and wild country in the lower 48 for a week or two, and I often didn't even bother to tell anyone where I was going. Maybe I had what they call a death wish, but I think it was more like being in denial. I didn't think anything could or would happen to me. I acted like I was invincible, but I definitely wasn't. One beautiful summer day, I decided to head out for a few days of climbing around the Ice Lakes Basin area, near Silverton, Colorado, high in the San Juan Mountains. I had my eye on several peaks, including Golden Horn and Vermilion, both over 13,000 feet. I knew I would see few, if any other climbers, as most people were doing the big wall climbs and the 14ers, those peaks over 14,000 feet. That left this wild country all to me, though I've heard it's become more crowded in the years since this happened in the mid-1990s. Ice Lakes Basin is a stiff climb when wearing a backpack, and mine was loaded to the gills. I left my old beater car at the trailhead and took off in mid-afternoon. I had hiked the trail before, and I knew I had time to get to the basin before dark, 
even though it was steep and a bit hard on the knees. I tend to bring everything I might need. I'd rather be prepared than travel light, I guess. I always regretted bringing so much stuff, as I seldom used it all. But the rare time that I needed something, I was sure to have it. I made it to the basin just as darkness fell, and like I predicted, I hadn't seen another soul. Lower and upper ice lakes are both relatively small, but glaciated lakes right at the timberline, set in a basin beneath some impressive peaks. I planned to camp the next night at the upper basin, which has an old mining cabin at its edge and has seen better days, though it is still standing. It was next to Fuller Lake, with Fuller Peak towering above. I had my little tent up in no time, and my stove out with water boiling for a freeze-dried meal of spaghetti. Even freeze-dried stuff tastes good when you're outdoors. After dinner, I just sat and looked at the stars in amazement. I have never seen stars like what you see in the San Juans. It's a combination of thin atmosphere from the high altitude and clean air, and the sky unfolds layer after layer of stars, so thick that you feel totally insignificant. It's beautiful, although humbling. It's always cold at night when you get into the higher altitudes like that, and even though it was late August, I had on my sweater and down coat, and I was still chilly. I was also tired, so I went to bed soon after sunset, which was in itself worth the hike up there. It was so colorful. Lots of mare's tails that picked up a wide range of pinks and purples, and even oranges. I should have taken more notice that they were mare's tails, but I was tired. I was sleeping well, which was good, as I sometimes can't sleep at all at altitudes above 11,000 feet, when suddenly I woke up with a start. Something had just torn apart a big log not too far from my tent. Whatever it was then dropped it, making the ground shake. I had noticed the log earlier, and it was huge, especially considering it was at Timberline, where trees struggle to make a living. That log was about three feet across, though not very long. Whatever had picked it up had to be a big, strong animal. My first thought was a bear, as they'll do that, break logs to get at the grubs inside. But it must be a big bear, and there wasn't supposed to be anything in this area but black bears, which typically don't get that big. Maybe it was a remnant grizzly, I thought, as the last known grizzly in the San Juans was killed in the early 1970s. But maybe this one had survived? The longer I laid there, the more scared I got. If that were a grizz, I would easily be dinner, and this tent would provide absolutely no defense. All I had was my pocket knife, so I would be history. I could now hear footsteps, and whatever it was, this thing was very heavy, and the ground kind of shook a bit as it walked. Was it coming my way? God, I was scared. I had to do something quickly. I really didn't even think about this, but I sat up and felt around in my pack until I found my little cooking pan and I pulled it out. I then found a spoon and my headlamp, crawled out of my little tent and turned on the light, and I started yelling and dancing around in circles while banging on the pan with the spoon and wailing. I did this until I was tired. I don't know, maybe five minutes? When I stopped, I was out of breath, but I shined my headlamp all around and I saw nothing. After standing there a while and listening, I crawled back in and went to sleep. Whatever it was, I had obviously outweirded it. I woke the next morning to blue skies, and I immediately went over to investigate the log. Now I was really creeped out, because all around the log were footprints, but they weren't bear prints. But it looked like photos I've seen of big footprints. I realized I was hyperventilating. I looked all around me, but I saw no sign of anything. I had obviously scared it off. Thinking about it later, it makes me laugh at the thought that such actions could scare Bigfoot away. But my ignorance was bliss. It had probably enjoyed the show, thinking about how crazy humans are. Actually, I wasn't feeling blissful at all, but I was scared. I didn't even make coffee or breakfast or anything. I just quickly broke camp and stuffed everything in my pack. It was time to get out. I started back down the trail and then I stopped. Getting away from the scene made me feel better, and I decided to stop and make breakfast. It was a beautiful, sunny, bluebird day. Why would I run away? The creature wouldn't bother me now, it was long gone, and now it was daylight. I relaxed a bit and I made some freeze-dried eggs and bacon and then coffee. I felt much better. Why was I leaving again? Oh, a Bigfoot? Didn't they not exist? 
I turned around and I went back up the trail. I'd come to climb and I was nearly there. The hard part was done, getting up to the lower basin, and the upper basin wasn't that far. I'd go on up, climb Goldenhorn, and then decide whether to leave. The day was young. I could still get out by dark if I hustled. I left my pack by a landmark rock, and I made up a day pack, and then I proceeded to climb the mountain. It was aptly named, the top being a glaciated horn. I was excited to make the summit, and I sat there a while, looking down on Trout Lake on the other side of the drainage. Massive and impressive peaks surrounded me. So many peaks, but so little time. I noticed a little bit of a breeze picking up, and then I could see a thick band of dark clouds to the west. A storm was coming in. It was then that the previous day's mare's tails clicked, and I realized something big was coming, not just a small storm. I needed to get out. My decision had been made for me. By now it was mid-afternoon. I had dawdled a bit and was running behind schedule. I planned to get out by dark, but it was still doable. I just needed to get a move on. But you don't want to hurry down a mountain when you're tired and likely to slip, so it took a while before I got back to my pack. There was no sign of anyone, and the breeze had died down to a stillness that seemed unnatural. I knew it was only a few hours on down to my car, mostly an easy downhill hike, so I made myself a peanut butter jelly sandwich and enjoyed what were to be my last moments in the basin. It was so beautiful, and I hated to leave. I pulled out my camera, and I took some photos, trying to make a panorama that I could glue together later. All of a sudden, literally from nowhere, a stiff wind hit. It nearly knocked me off my feet, shrieking and carrying red dust from Utah that quickly obscured the basin. Within minutes, I was in the middle of a gale-force windstorm with almost zero visibility. I couldn't believe that conditions could change that fast. Apparently, that dark cloud was bringing in some really nasty weather. I quickly managed to get my big pack onto my back and head down the trail with a sense of urgency. The wind was bitter cold, cutting literally right through me. I could barely stay on my feet, and it had gotten noticeably darker. It was soon spitting snow, making everything slick. I felt like such an idiot. What kind of outdoorsman would ignore all the obvious signs? This was the kind of ignorance that led to people reading about your demise in the paper and commenting on how stupid you were. The Darwin Award, they called it. Climber goes alone, tells no one, sees signs of a major storm all over the place, ignores the signs, oh, and a Bigfoot, Throw that in for good measure. Now I was in a full-on blizzard, and it had been only 20 minutes ago I was blissfully eating a PBJ on a rock in the sunshine. I grew up in the mountains of Colorado, and I knew how fast conditions could change. Yet here I was, stumbling down a rocky trail that would lead me in a couple of hours to the safety of my car, if only I could see where to go. The visibility got worse and worse, and I could no longer even make out the trail. Where the heck was I? I needed to stop and set up my tent and hunker down, before I got totally lost. But the winds were so vicious, I wasn't even sure I could get my tent up. And what if it snowed several feet? My little tent would be totally buried. Now I was worried sick. How did I get into this predicament? And then I could barely make out something dark nearby, and it didn't look like a rock or a tree. It was the old cabin. I had somehow managed to stumble upon the old cabin. The door was laying there on the ground, so I just went on in. It was weird, having the winds drop off. As soon as I was inside, there was no wind pushing me around, and I could kind of gather my senses. This cabin was old and decaying and musty, with one corner kind of collapsing, but it had stood there for at least a hundred years, so I guessed I could safely spend a night there without worry. It was now almost completely dark from the storm, so I pulled out my headlamp and I proceeded to organize my camp around me before it got pitch black. My down sleeping bag would probably get me through the night. I'd just have to pray that I didn't get snowed in. I spread my pad out and shook out the bag, hoping that there weren't any critters in the cabin that would want to sleep with me. I sat there for a while, and then I decided to make some dinner. Freeze-dried beef stew. The winds howled on as I slowly ate. After that... There was nothing to do but hunker down in my bag and try to stay warm. It was only about six or seven in the evening, but it was dark. I was soon fast asleep, the wind raging outside. 
I had climbed a big mountain, so I was tired. Plus the lack of oxygen at that altitude makes you want to sleep. It must have been about midnight when I woke up. The winds were unbelievable. I went to college in Boulder, and I once was in 70 mile per hour winds there, and these seemed even higher. The whole cabin was shaking, and I wondered if the old structure would make it through. I can't begin to describe the fury of the winds. It was as scary as it could get. I got out of my bag and shined my light out the door. The snow had stopped, which was good. I might be able to get out as soon as daylight came. It looked like there was only about three or four inches on the ground. It was then that I noticed a faint odor, like a cross between something dead and a ripe garbage can. It was inside the cabin. I hadn't noticed it before. Had I just missed it from all the craziness of trying to get settled and survive? It definitely was not there before I decided, as I have a sensitive nose and I would have smelled it no matter what. It was puzzling. I crawled back into my bag, wanting to preserve the warmth. I laid there, trying to get back to sleep, but this smell had me puzzled. What was it? Was it just the smell of the old cabin? Maybe. But in these winds, any smells should be over in Silverton or beyond by now, as the cabin was getting lots of ventilation. Something didn't feel right. I finally drifted back off, warm in my bag, still tired. I have no idea how long I slept before I woke again. The odor was now stronger, and a sixth sense told me to lay completely still. There was something in the cabin with me, something alive and smelly. I didn't dare turn on my light or even move. I was terrified. What if it was the creature from last night? I laid there, frozen. I finally heard something over in the corner opposite me, which must have been loud to be heard over the wind, so I listened. It was someone snoring. Oh my god, there was someone in here, and they were really big to make that kind of snore. And now, I needed to pee, but I didn't dare move, and that only added to my misery. I laid there as the wind howled and the night slowly wore on, wondering if I was dreaming. Finally, I gave up, slipped out of my bag, peed in the corner of the building, and then crawled back into bed. After crawling back into my bag, I could see two red eyes shining in the darkness. They had nothing to reflect off of. They were shining with their own energy, and I was again brutally terrified. I had an overwhelming urge to sleep, and I tried to fight it, but I couldn't. I drifted off. Whatever it was, if it wanted to harm me, there wasn't much I could do about it, and it seemed like it was just seeking shelter, like I was. I thought about this later, and I really did fight that sleeping feeling. I wanted to stay awake with all of my might, as I was afraid of dying in there, but I just couldn't. It was almost like I had been drugged. I woke at dawn and the creature was gone. The winds had stopped completely and a soft snow was falling. I quickly gathered my gear and headed down the hill. The trail was mostly covered with snow, but it wasn't hard to make out the way, just go down. A few hours later, I found my car. It had about six inches of snow on it, and it was now snowing harder. I cleaned off the windshield, prayed it would start, which it did, and then cranked the heater and left. I barely made it to the highway, sliding and skidding, as the forest service road wasn't plowed. It was August, for God's sake. I drove into Silverton and got a hotel room. No way was I going to try to get over Red Mountain Pass in a snowstorm. I hated driving it when it was dry. I think I slept all day, as I don't really remember much, except luxuriating in the warmth and security. I did wake several times in terror, thinking I could hear loud snoring. I knew what was making the sound up in that cabin, because I saw its footprints in the snow as I headed out. At least 20 inches long, and with five toes, what I'd call a Bigfoot. In the summer of 1988, when I was just a little girl of eight years old, my family decided to take a vacation to the best place, the Ozarks. I don't remember what the name was, but it was very family-oriented. I loved playing in the forest as a girl. Our campsite was nestled in the heart of nature. It even had some swings on the trees. The campground put these huge cartoon figures out that looked like they were various playground equipment. Some were slides and other were teeter-totters. I thought this was pretty swanky as a kid. They even had them off trails or rest areas. This campground had everything. 
So it was no surprise when one evening, as the sun began to set, my parents and I decided to take a hike along one of the many winding trails that crisscrossed the area. I remember the air was thick with the scent of pine, and the sounds of chirping birds and rustling leaves filled my ears. Every year, I lived for this experience. We ventured deeper into the woods, and I was so happy to be there with my parents. But that was soon shattered by an eerie hooting noise that pierced through the forest. We waited a minute to hear anything else, but nothing sounded. I remember thinking, wow, that must be the biggest owl ever. We kept walking until we came across a bench. My parents needed a break, and I wanted to keep exploring. They told me to stay where they could see me as I wandered nearby. I heard the hooting again, and I saw my parents drawn into conversation. That's when I saw one massive cartoon character. I had walked this trail before and wondered what kind of adventure awaited me. I kept hearing the hooting, and it only seemed to be coming closer. Curiosity got the better of me, and against my parents' warnings, I veered further off the path and followed the sound. The hooting abruptly stopped, replaced with this odd long scratching noise. I walked closer to the new playground piece. The scratching grew louder with each step, echoing through the forest. What looked like hard lines from far away began to soften and look furrier. I wondered if there were branches scraping up against it. After all, it was in the bush. I recall feeling a bit angry at them for not taking good care of one of these playground creatures. My mind raced with thoughts of what could be causing such a disturbing noise. And then I saw it. The massive playground creature stood up and emerged from behind a cluster of trees, its hulking form silhouetted against the sunlight. It was a Bigfoot. I laughed at myself, thinking, well, I guess I can't be too mad now. My laughter quickly turned to fear, as it had gripped me like never before. My small frame trembled as I took in the sight before me, a creature that shouldn't be standing in front of me, but here I was, looking like an ant next to this thing. I stood frozen in place as this creature slowly turned its gaze towards me. In that moment, time seemed to stand still. This creature's eyes bore into mine. Its shaggy fur, a mix of earthy browns and deep blacks, glistened in the fading light. Each strand seemed to hold a story of its own. Even though it was shaggy, I thought it was the coolest thing I had ever seen in my life. I gazed into its face, and I was dumbstruck by the intensity of its eyes. Deep pools of darkness stared right back at me, and holding my breath, I just stood there gawking at him. And then this creature just vanished into the woods. The scratching noises and hooting stopped, leaving behind a silence that hung heavy in the air. I stood there, my heart was pounding in my chest, realizing that it could have been much worse though. At least Bigfoot had chosen to disappear rather than to confront me. And then, my parents were calling out for me. I didn't know how I found the physical strength to move, but I did. I told them that I thought I had seen one of the cartoon characters, but it was only Bigfoot. At first they laughed about it, and when they saw that I was being completely serious, they stopped laughing. I think there was this speech about never speaking of this again to anyone, or rather never telling anyone what I had seen ever again. The one thing I know for sure, ever since that day, I never looked at the playground cartoon figures the same again. The wood apes first visited my home when I was only a child. I'm inclined to say that I was about five when it happened, but I was so young at the time that I can't recall my exact age. Although I don't want to reveal where it took place for safety reasons, I'll just say that I lived in a modest-sized town in Northern California. One of the most interesting things about my experience is that the town that it occurred in isn't that rural. It's certainly far more common to hear about there being Bigfoot sightings in more remote regions than in suburban or inner city areas, yet the latter is where my sighting took place. My parents got divorced when I was quite young, and I ended up living at my stepfather's house after my mom remarried. We lived on a safe street that didn't lead to an outlet, so there wasn't even much traffic. I was a shy kid, but I remember my stepfather always tried to get me to warm up to him by buying me all sorts of cool toys. One time after I got home from preschool or daycare, he had what was called a G.I. Joe Power Wheels waiting for me in the driveway. 
I've since been told that it was something I often nagged my mom to buy me. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Power Wheels, it's like a slow electric go-kart that is intended for young kids. They were hot commodities in the early 90s, and if you were one of the lucky kids to get your hands on one of them, you became an instant celebrity among your pals. Some people might think this was a bit irresponsible, but because my stepdad had an incredibly long driveway, they allowed me to drive the thing around outside by myself. I can vividly recall how I was forbidden to go anywhere near the street, so at least they did do a good job of getting me to abide by that one rule. My stepdad was a regular guy who was gone for most of the day working on his white-collar career. However, sometimes when he came home from the office, he would immediately head outside to chop wood. I'd later come to learn from my mom that this was one of his techniques for letting off steam. Due to his habit of this, there was always a large pile of chopped wood lying on a patch of grass near the basketball hoop. There was this one day where I was riding up and down the driveway in my power wheels when I thought I saw someone quickly walk over and duck behind the mound of chopped wood. I should probably mention that this driveway wasn't straight. About three quarters of the way up the driveway, you could veer left and park by the front door. Or if you went straight, you would end up in the garage. I was finishing a loop around the circle when I saw the figure duck for cover. I didn't really think too much of it at first because I think I just figured it had to be my mom or someone visiting the house. I was aware that my stepfather was out of town on business, so I knew it couldn't have been him. I can't really remember being frightened in that moment. If anything, I'd say I was just more curious about why someone would be hiding from me. I'm sure that I had continued to drive around the loop a second time when I looked towards the woodpile and saw what I called a forest person, run out from the side of the pile that was opposite where I had come in. I was probably about 50 yards away when I saw it come out of hiding. The weirdest thing about it was how it zigzagged across the grass until it disappeared. I've been to the zoo many times since then, and I've noticed that the chimps and a few other kinds of primates behave in a very similar fashion to what I saw on that day. It could have been due to how far away I was, but I don't remember being overly surprised by its size. It was kind of crouched over, but it didn't come across to me that it was much bigger than any of the adult men I knew. However, its shape and proportions were noticeably abnormal. It looked much top-heavier than a regular human, but in a muscular sort of way. While staying in the tiny electric vehicle, I called out for my mother a couple of times, but there was no answer. I stayed put for a couple of minutes before I eventually stepped out of the power wheels and walked up to our front door. When I found my mom upstairs, I tried to explain to her as best as I could about what I had just seen, but her reaction was predictable. She just laughed and told me that the game I was playing with my imaginary friend sounded like a lot of fun. Truth be told, I also probably wasn't very exact or descriptive at the time, but I left her room feeling frustrated that she wasn't listening to me. I remember going into the various rooms of the second floor and staring out the windows for long periods of time, hoping that I'd see something to satisfy my curiosity. At the time, the book, Where the Wild Things Are, was a bedtime hit, and I'm convinced that that book was the only reason that I was more curious rather than afraid during that initial sighting. I don't think it was more than a few days later when I was outside in my driveway riding my power wheels again. I suddenly noticed a dark shape standing in the woods, not all that far off from where the woodpile was located. Though it was completely motionless, I only noticed it because it was a different shade than the rest of the environment. I also probably wouldn't have even acknowledged it if it wasn't for what I had seen only a few days earlier. The ease with which it blended into its surroundings now makes me think that these wood apes are probably around us a heck of a lot more than we would ever imagine. I remember hitting the brakes on my power wheels and just staring at the figure that was partially obscured by the hanging leaves. I could see one of its eyes. After a little more time passed, both of us remaining frozen like statues, I wondered why it didn't seem to blink. I have the visual of that unblinking eye burned into my retinas. It was like a black marble that was much larger than a human's eyeball. 
It's strange that I have that memory, because the more I've thought about it since, the more I've realized that I was parked a considerable distance from the figure. Therefore, it must have been looking at me with really wide eyes to give me the impression that its eyeball was so large. In fact, the figure was so completely still that I remember wondering if someone had placed a large wooden sculpture in the woods. This trend of us staring at one another lasted for a good amount of time before my intuition told me to turn my miniature vehicle around and drive away. It was like I had this instinct that I should avoid further eye contact, almost as if it would be rude or provocative to continue doing so. After I did another lap around the loop in front of our house, I glanced in the direction of the woods and the figure was completely gone. However, it had to have only just left, because I distinctly remember how, although all else was stationary, the branches in that area swayed. As I continued to sit in my little vehicle, glancing around for any sign of the figure, I heard the front door open. Out walked my mother with the telephone in hand. Her voice was jittery, and I could tell right away that something was wrong. I, I'm not sure, she said to the person on the other line. They just didn't look right, like they might have been on something. She quietly but quickly grabbed my hand and ushered me out of the vehicle and towards the house. She continued to look around as she listened to the person on the other end of the line. I somehow knew to remain quiet until after we stepped inside the house. Thank you, I will, my mother said as she hung up the phone and then locked the door behind her. When I asked what was the matter, she did her best to play it down by turning on her playful voice and tickling me as she nudged me into the kitchen. She immediately picked up the phone again and called my stepdad. I sat in front of the small kitchen television, watching TV, but I could hear her asking my stepdad if there was anyone at all who he could think of that would have had a reason to come to the house unannounced. I know that sometimes the electricity company employees did that from time to time, so that's probably the type of thing she was hoping he would say. But I'm sure that she got even more worried when she came outside to get me and realized that there were no vehicles parked in the driveway. I've always wondered what she saw on that day, and since then, she's always been a bit vague when explaining it. It's kind of like her brain is trying to suppress the memory because it's too traumatic to dwell on. Soon after we had gone inside, there was a knock on the door, and my mother let a couple of police officers in. She made me stay in the kitchen, but my curiosity got the best of me, and I snuck around the corner to try and hear what they were saying. I couldn't understand much of what they said, but I did hear my mother mention how she saw a nude intruder run across the yard and head into the woods that surrounded the property. I believe the officers took another look around the area, but couldn't find anything. I didn't see any signs of the wood apes for years after that, and I believe this is because after that situation, my mother stopped allowing me to be outside by myself. I then saw them again when I was 11 years old. I was watching a movie with a babysitter while both my mother and stepfather were out of town for their anniversary. I was completely immersed in the movie when my babysitter, Julie, started screaming at the top of her lungs. She jumped off the sofa and began to cower behind it. I saw she was facing the window, so with my heart already racing, I looked over and saw two dark, very tall figures looking at me through the glass. My perceptions of the world had changed from when I was younger, so I found these beings to be much more intimidating than when I was only five. Because of this, I hopped off the couch and ran upstairs and hid in the common area, which was away from any windows. I think I felt more secure in that position because I could see and hear what was going on downstairs. I heard Julie jog over to the phone and call the police. I'm not at all surprised that it was a very similar outcome to the last time the police were summoned. They found nothing, and they said they would keep an eye on the property. That was the last time I ever saw anything like that, though there were a few occasions where each of us admitted to hearing very unusual noises during the night. I was 13 when we moved out of that house and out of the state altogether. We ended up moving to New York City, a place that made those previous experiences feel even more surreal. My stepfather has since passed, but he claimed to have never seen anything out of the ordinary while living there. There's still a chance that he could have been in denial, but I'll never know. 
I've always wished that there was a way I could get in touch with that babysitter through social media, but neither my mother nor I can remember her last name. I was a nail technician working at a salon in Oregon. One day, after a long day of work, I decided to go for a hike in the nearby woods to clear my head. Day in and day out, I'm working my butt off over people's nails. This was in 1996, and there was no doom scrolling to take my mind away from a particularly awful day. I decided to head to the Trail of Ten Falls. It's about an hour from where I work and live. It's one of the best places to go if you love solitude and waterfalls. It's huge, and it's a great place to disappear from people. The forest was peaceful and calm, and I felt at ease as I walked through the trees. I decided to rest by one of the waterfalls and dip my feet in. I usually do this to rip the stress away, and in any normal situation, it works like a charm. But today, I just couldn't seem to shake off my stress. I remember thinking how stupid I was for holding on to so much drama. Even though the waterfall is incredibly loud, I can still hear all the animals and wind flowing in their environment. I think that's one of those things that I love about this area. That's why when it got so quiet, it was so weird. Aside from the splashing water, I couldn't even hear the sloshing of the fish. And then there was a rustling sound coming from the bushes ahead of me. It was so loud in the quiet forest that I could have jumped on a branch and clung like a cat, but instead, I decided to stay as still as I could. At first, I didn't think anything of it. Maybe it was just a small animal or the wind. But as I got closer, I saw a huge figure towering across from me. The trees split, revealing what I first thought was a bear, and I was terrified. My heart flip-flopped all over the place as I recognized it. It was a Bigfoot. There was nothing in my being that could come up with any other explanations. It was very obviously a bipedal ape creature. I stood there frozen as it approached me, its massive steps shaking the ground beneath me. I tried to back away slowly, but it was getting closer and closer. And just as I thought I was done for, it stopped and looked me up and down. Within a moment, all the drama at the salon didn't seem to matter. The creature's massive frame was covered in thick, dark fur, and each strand of hair stood out against its muscular body. Its broad shoulders and powerful limbs were a testament to its primal might. The stature alone was truly remarkable. This thing stood at least eight feet tall, its hulking form casting a shadow over the surrounding rocks. Its long arms hung by its sides, ending in hands with fingers that seemed capable of crushing boulders. As I studied its face, I couldn't help but be captivated by its features. Its deep-set eyes were framed by a prominent brow ridge. It had a strong jawline and a wide mouth that revealed rows of sharp teeth. I thought it was going to attack me. I remember thinking that I was in a bad situation, and the last thing I said to my coworkers was, screw you. I would never have a chance to make amends for what happened or why I was so angry. In that moment, I was convinced I was going to die, but instead, it just stood there, staring at me with its glowing red eyes. It felt like hours that we just stood there staring at each other. I was too scared to move, even if it seemed like it wasn't going to harm me. It blinked at me, and I blinked at it, and then finally, after what felt like a lifetime, it turned and walked away. I stood there shaking for a while, and then I ran back to the salon as fast as I could. The experience was terrifying, and I never went hiking alone in those woods again. I still get chills every time I think about it. After returning to the salon, I was completely shaken up and scared. I could barely get a hold of myself, and my hands were still shaking. I told my colleagues about what happened, but I changed the creature to a bear, but they still didn't believe me. They thought I was making it up to scare them, so I just kept quiet, and I tried to go back to work as usual, and I tried to forget all about it. But after this experience, I realized that it's important to be aware of your surroundings and take precautions when hiking in the woods, especially if you're alone. Always carry a map, a compass, and a charged phone, and tell someone where you're going and when you expect to be back. I hope my encounter serves as a cautionary tale to others who may be considering a hike in the Oregon woods. I don't know where to begin. 
Strange things have been happening on and off since 2007. I live in central Texas, and my husband was stationed at Fort Hood. I love to walk with my dogs early morning. I walk in an area that has houses, but they are spaced out with wooded areas all around. The river is maybe a mile from me, as the crow flies. I was out walking one morning, and I noticed some cedar trees approximately eight feet high. The top branches had been twisted and snapped down. A couple of weeks later, I was walking again, and I noticed complete silence. Creepy silence. And then I heard something yell, more like a wail. It wasn't a dog howling, and my dogs were listening, but stayed very still. So I started noticing a neighbor's fence. After that, on my walk over, where I heard the yell. He has a five and a half chain link fence with wooden posts. The top of the fence had been pushed down, but not bent. On the bottom, where you would place your foot to climb over the fence, just on top. Just like something with long legs had just stepped over. I started noticing large footprints where I'd always stop to let my dogs drink water. There was a large pool of water that would fill up after it rained. Basically just a ditch. Skip to early 2008, my husband was out of town, and I woke up around 1 in the morning to something making a loud whooping noise in my backyard. I laid there, freaking out, because whatever it was, was chattering, like a babbling kind of talk. I heard my cat at the back door to be let in, and this thing started mimicking my cat. Meanwhile, my dogs were in the bedroom with me and were just sitting up listening, but not making any noise. I just thought I had to get my cat in, so I turned on the light by the bed and it stopped making noise. I crept to the back door, opened it slightly, and the cat shot in. Towards the end of that year, maybe 2009, I woke up again around 3 a.m. My husband was out of town again, but my mother-in-law was visiting. Something was screaming up on a hill behind my house. We thought it was a woman, a woman being slaughtered. It was terrible sounding, and it went on for about 10 minutes. Looking back, we should have called the police, but it just didn't sound human. I don't know. It was hard to explain. So maybe a year later, out on a walk one morning, another neighbor's fence, right by the ditch where I've seen footprints, his fence had been completely yanked out. A chain-link fence with metal poles stuck in concrete just pulled out and up towards the road. When he had it repaired, he placed barbed wire on top. Anyway, I've continued to hear and see things on and off over the years. Last August, I think I caught a glimpse of one. I was driving down our country road about 60 miles per hour, and I saw something tall and completely inky black step into the tree line. I just kept going and thought, I did not see that. It was just a quick glimpse, so I'm not sure. I made a report with Texas Bigfoot, but they never contacted me back. Am I just imagining things, or do you think something is going on? If you've had an encounter or sighting of a Sasquatch and would like your story told here, please email us at bigfootcasefiles at mail.com. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for listening.